Good morning. We are excited to see you here today, and we hope you are excited about coming and worshiping the Lord today. So if you're able, let's stand together. So as you know, we're starting off August. We're going to sing all month August some of our older songs. This is from 19, 1998. Go ahead. And uh, I was just telling Jerry this morning, you're just saying, man, I really like all these old songs. So I don't know whether we just haven't done them in a while or whether we just liked them from before. But anyway, we're going to sing together. Sing out if you can. Let's uh, see if we can put our hands together. All right. We'll let Marianne start us out.
Some of you were not even born when we were singing that song. And uh, it, it just is sometimes kind of fun to have a blast from the past. But these songs that we're singing all month were songs that we've sang here before during worship. And so I hope you enjoy them as well as we do. Uh, for those of you that have brought offerings today during communion, we have buckets up at the front. I want to let you know that if you would still like to help uh, collect uh, school supplies for Honduras, there's a jar back there if you just want to make a monetary donation. Uh, we'll still be collecting this week uh, up through the 11th. And... Um, So, give them something. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for allowing us to gather together. I pray, Father, for the service that uh, as we sing songs that may be a bit older, we no longer sing in our current rotation, uh, they still express our desire to lift high the name of Jesus and to bring him honor and glory. Control the service, Father, still our hearts. Help us to focus on you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue by singing the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about 
Amen. Take a moment, turn to your neighbors this morning, greet them in the Lord today. we'll use it a lot. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with a wind of power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with a wind of power and love. Our God is an awesome God. seat this morning. <laughs> so, we want to give you an opportunity to give some thanks or praise to God for what he is doing or just because he is. Would anyone like to share? I have a question for you. Yes. Is it better to give money or to bring products for Honduras? I'm thinking of the mailing and everything. It is up to you. No, there has to be a better way. <laughs> there must be a best way. Will the dollar go further down there? Jean? <laughs> Some, someone will wind up coming to pick up whatever material that we have here, and then we will send out money to California where they can go ahead and do shopping yeah, but, there as well. Okay. So. What'd she say? She said they can buy the products cheaper down there than Ex they can Exactly. Here. That's what I was wondering too. They so, you know, if you want to, you know, write that $200 check or whatever else like that, that'll go a long way. Is, is there a box up? Did he say $2 check? Is there a $200 box out there? Is there a $200 box? Is there a place to put it? There's right there in the jar. Oh, there's a jar? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And praise the Lord for a beautiful weekend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord that I am out of the boot. <laughs> Woo! And I go back to work part-time Monday. Wow. Kurt's a slave driver there, man, putting you back to work already after having surgery not long ago. I get it. 
Cool. <laughs> Anything else? I, we were at Lake Ann Camp this whole week, and boy, I tell you what, there's nothing more fun in my heart than to watch those kids just burning for the Lord. It was, it was a really good week. Good deal. And my granddaughters were part of it. That makes it even better. <laughs> I know, yeah. If there's no one else, let's stand and sing together. Draw me close to you.
Amen. You may have a seat this morning. So I have uh, come to the realization that our circumstances often dictate our moods, our emotions. If it's a bright, sunny day, everything seems to look bright and cheery and optimistic. If it's gray and rainy and cold, things seem to look bleak and depressing, at least to me. I mentioned last week how Psalm 5 is arranged in a wonderful way, kind of like a sandwich, you know? And in verses 1 through 3, we find a plea. That's one of the pieces of the bread. And in verse 12, we find a promise. And so these are the two pieces that make up the outer part of the sandwich, the bread. And within those verses are three focal points. And those focal points deal with the present circumstances that the writer was facing at this time, in this case, King David. I believe reflecting on the truths that are found in these three points deal with his present circumstances. I had mentioned last week, I don't know if you remember, but Psalm 5 is referred to as a psalm of lament. David knew firsthand what it was like to face trying circumstances. Uh, He was not... uh, overly excited about things in his present situation when he wrote this. He was probably bummed out a bit depressed. I would be too if someone's chasing after me to kill me. So he did what is important for all of us to do when you face difficult times. He takes and he brings this petition, this plea, before God asking him for help. Let me uh, review some of these things that we saw last week as far as the plea goes because there's three points that we looked at in detail. The first is we have instant access to the throne. So as David faces his challenges, just like we often face, he prays and presents his needs to God knowing he has instant access to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ also have instant access to the throne. We're not put on hold. We don't have to leave a message for God to get back to us. He hears us. I like that. I like that. I hate being placed on hold and just waiting and waiting. The other thing that we noticed in there was that we should start our day with God, starting our day with God establishes who is our help, who is our guidance guidance for that present day. It reflects the importance of staying in communication with God because our relationship needs communication like any relationship does. And finally, we should wait with expectation, knowing that in his time and in his way, God will answer our prayers according to his perfect will. So after David presents his plea, we begin to see some of the circumstances and the people that are involved in those circumstances that prompted him to write this psalm of lament in verses 4 through 7. Within those eight verses, I see three divisions or subsections. And the first we'll be looking at today, found in verses 4 through 6. We read, You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men, the Lord abhors. So in these uh, three verses, there are seven things that the author mentions about God, and we'll look at those in more detail that are worth noting. First of all, in verse 4, God takes no pleasure in evil. Also in verse 4, God has no fellowship with the wicked, Verse 5, no one will be able to boast before him. 
Verse 5, God hates workers of iniquity. Verse 6, God destroys liars. And also in verse 6, God utterly detests murderers. Ah, one more, sorry. God detests deceivers, also in verse 6. Why does David review these truths? Perhaps he did so because for him it's kind of therapeutic remembering all these wonderful attributes of God. As he focuses on God's character, it helps him dispel the discouragement that he may be facing and provide for him encouragement and assurance. Again, not to sound like a broken record, but you know that's why we spent 18 weeks looking at the attributes of God. Not so that you would have more head knowledge, but I feel the more you know about God, those things that you know about him should affect how you live your life. So in these three verses, David has much to say about God and his character. The first two, which are mentioned in verse 4, deal with evil, and then the remaining five deal with some specific aspect of evil. So the first thing that David mentions about God is that he takes no pleasure in evil. He says, you are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. That's an important thing to understand about God. When we looked at the attribute of God called holiness, I shared with you a definition of holiness from one of my favorite preachers, one of my favorite authors, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said, holiness primarily means separation, separation from evil. It is essential, absolute purity. The psalmist says God takes no pleasure in evil. Why? How can he say that? Well, God takes no pleasure in evil because he's totally separate from evil. He is absolutely pure in his holiness. Evil is an affront to everything he is and everything he stands for. God never will and can never take pleasure in evil. He cannot be the source of of evil. Evil does not bring him enjoyment. He takes no pleasure in it. You know, as human beings, it is easy for us to find pleasure in evil. It is. I mean, finding pleasure in evil is one of the results that came about as a result of the fall. It's something that each and every one of us, even if we're in Christ Jesus, is going to need to battle with their entire life. Those temptations towards evil are real, are real, and at times they can be intense. As followers of Jesus, we must always be on guard against finding pleasure in evil because God finds no pleasure in evil. The second thing David mentions about God is also found in verse 4. God has no fellowship with the wicked. David said, with you, the wicked cannot dwell. If you recall uh, our discussion on Psalm 1, I had mentioned that there's basically, when you get down to the very basics, there's only two kinds of people in the world. There are the righteous, there are the wicked. There are those that are in the kingdom of God, and there are those who are outside the kingdom of God. God will bless those who are in the kingdom of God and does bless them. But as for the wicked, they will face condemnation when Jesus returns. They cannot or will not be able to fellowship with God because God takes no pleasure in evil. This naturally goes hand in hand with God's holiness. This leads to the third thing that David mentions about God, which is found in verse 5. No one will be able to boast before him. David said, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence. Now, the New American Standard doesn't use the word arrogant. Rather, it uses the word boastful. That translation says, the boastful should not stand 
before your eyes. The arrogant, the boastful, belong to the camp of the wicked, not the righteous. Pride, boastfulness, arrogance, they're not fruits of the Spirit. You're not going to find them listed as fruits of the Spirit. They're fruits of a selfish heart. The proud, the boastful, the arrogant relish in their own ability, in their own self-righteousness, in their own self-sufficiency. They feel that they can stand in the presence of God if they want to. However, the reality is no one comes to God on their own, not on their own ability and certainly not based on their own worth. God does not embrace the proud. You'll never find that in Scripture. He opposes them. Why? Because they're an affront to his holy nature. As I mentioned that, uh, last week, I'm not exactly certain when this psalm was written, but again, the context would make it appear that this is during a time that David uh, was fleeing for his life. He was facing evil people. It's had to be difficult times. Pride allowed the individual that was chasing after him to kill him, Saul, to offer up a sacrifice that he was not allowed to offer up, even though he was the king. He didn't follow protocol. Pride allowed him to pursue David so that he could kill him. Pride allows an individual to feel that if you cannot have something, or if you cannot be something, you are going to do all that you can to make sure no one else can as well. There's nothing righteous about this. Such a mentality, according to Scripture, is wicked. Such a mentality is evil. No one can come to God on their own merit or ability because God will not have fellowship with the wicked. Again, because he takes no pleasure in evil. The fourth thing David mentions in regard to God, I think is, is very, very sobering. God hates workers of iniquity. Verse 5 states, you hate all who do wrong. Iniquity is the absence of moral or spiritual values. This problem here is as old as man. It certainly has its beginnings in the fall of man. It can trace its roots back to when sin first entered the world, and it's been an ongoing problem with us ever since, and will continue to be an ongoing problem that we will face until Jesus returns again. The Apostle Paul cautioned Timothy to be on guard. Be on guard against those who do wrong. This problem is widespread, especially in the last days, which, by the way, are the days that we live in. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. I think it was very much true in the day and age with, when Paul wrote these words, and it certainly, certainly is true for where we are here in 2024. Is this an exhaustive list? I doubt it. But I think it's a pretty comprehensive list, don't you? I mean, do you think God finds pleasure in anything here that was just listed? The correct answer would be no, not at all. 
Before we look at the fifth thing that David mentions about God, I want to talk about something briefly that may be offensive to you. And so I'm making this disclaimer. Because I don't mean to be offensive. Not by any stretch of the imagination. I simply want to stay true to what Scripture says so that you may keep from believing, believing something that Scripture does not address, that does not say. Okay, let me cut to the chase. You probably have heard the comment that you have to hate the sin but love the sinner. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever probably shared that with others? Now, I understand the idea behind the statement. We should never, never love sin in any shape or form. But the idea is when it comes to love, we must love the sinner. Here's where it gets dicey. We are to express love, right, to all individuals who are created in the image of God. I don't think anybody will have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. But it seems to me that the love that we are to have for sinners is going to be different than the love that we are to have for God and the love that we are to have for the brethren, for those that are in Christ Jesus. I base this on the reasoning that one of the attributes of God is God is love. However, God expresses his love to those individuals that are in Christ differently then he does express his love to those who are perishing, to those who are wicked. I think that that's very obvious. It's also obvious that God hates sin. I, I think you'd have to agree with that truth, right? If you don't agree with that truth, we have some serious problem in understanding who God is. But let me draw your attention back to what David said about God in the last part of verse 5. David says, you hate all who do wrong. The New American Standard says, you hate all who do iniquity. The question that I would ask you is, where does it say that God hates the sin but loves the sinner? You find that in there? It doesn't say that, does it? It says God hates workers of iniquity. That's a pretty strong statement. Pretty strong. Let me take it one step further. I've mentioned on how many, many occasions that when Jesus returns again, he is going to ultimately deal with sin once and for all in all of its shapes and form. Anything and everything that is connected to sin will be done away with for good. And then he is going to judge the living and the dead. Those individuals whose names are found in the book of life will not face everlasting punishment. Those whose names are not included in the book of life will face punishment. They will face the wrath of God because based on who God is, he has to pour out his wrath upon sin, including the sinner. He has to. Sin is not a living, breathing entity like human beings like angels, like any other living creature. Sin is a condition. Sin is a spiritual infection. Sin is a deadly virus that will eventually require the life of the one who is infected unless the appropriate treatment is applied. Sin in all its shapes and forms must be done away with when Jesus returns. But do you realize 
that it's not sin that's going to stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ? It's not sin that is going to face condemnation like those individuals whose names are not found in the Lamb's book of life? Sin, unlike the lost, will not stand in the judgment seat of God any more than sin can receive salvation. Salvation is only, those, is only granted to those individuals that are created in the image of God, and it's granted to those whom God chooses. That means sin must be punished. It must be punished by a righteous, perfect, holy God, a God who hates sin as well as sinners. You cannot separate sin from sinners. The psalmist says, God hates those who do iniquity. He has to. And so must we if we're to follow God's standard of right or wrong. Unfortunately, our understanding of what hate means makes this very difficult. Very difficult. For example, we often attach actions and attitudes towards those we hate that do not honor or bring glory to God in any way. Human hatred is often judgmental and harmful. Why? Because it's infected with sin. God hates workers of iniquity. The fifth thing David says in regard to God reflects his hatred towards sin as well as sinners, and it's found in verse 6. He said, you destroy those who tell lies. Now, granted, God doesn't do this instantaneously, and I'm glad he doesn't. But at some point in time, it will be addressed on Judgment Day in the final judgment. Revelation 21, verse 8 says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual, immoral, immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars will face judgment. Will face judgment. Please know that God is not just singling out one sin that he will destroy. It's simply one example. God will not only destroy liars, he's going to destroy adulterers and murderers and thieves and so on. He will have to destroy all who are unbelievers, all who remain slaves to sin. Then in verse 6, and we find the sixth and seventh thing that David says about God. Both of these are examples of things that God hates. Granted, the word hate is not specifically mentioned. Rather, David used the word abhor. And abhor simply means to hate or detest. The sixth thing David mentions is that God detests murderers. He hates murderers. The NIV uses the word bloodthirsty. But bloodthirsty simply means murderers because bloodthirsty individuals take away life from someone. God told Moses that the life of living creatures is in the blood. Whether it is literally or symbolically, murderers shed blood by taking away life, which is why God detests murderers. In Genesis 9, 6, we read, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. It's a matter of life for life. The seventh thing that David mentions has to do with something else that God abhors or detests. He detests deceivers. Now, these individuals naturally are 
closely tied to liars because deceivers don't promote truth. What you see is not what you get. These individuals are dishonest. They try to get other individuals to embrace something that is not real or is not true. In verse 3, David mentions evil, boasting, iniquity, lying, murder, deception. Certainly those kind of things have to be characteristic of the individuals that David was encountering when this psalm was written. I don't worry about it, David, my son. I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> and he's out of sight, and there goes Saul, back after him. When you face such conditions day after day, day in and day out, I mean, that can be just oppressive. No wonder why he was lamenting. But then on the other side is God, a holy God. And while David may not be able to do anything to stop what he is facing, he knows God can. And he knows God does, which is why in verse 2 he cries out to God for help. Recognizing the fact that you and I live in a world that is terminally infected with evil, I hope you cling to the sustaining principles that are found in this psalm. May they increase your knowledge of God. I pray that you will act upon this knowledge every day of your lives. These principles are not new. In fact, we address them when we examine the attributes of God. But they are worth repeating because we so quickly forget those things that we learn, especially when we're facing tough times. They're worth repeating because they're still true. They are worth repeating because they still bring comfort and encouragement and peace. Let me share them with you. Number one, God is not the source of evil. When I say he is not the source, I'm referring to creating evil or expressing evil in his creation as an attribute of his being. There is no evil in God, nor can he be the source of evil. And David acknowledges this in this song, even though he is experiencing evil all around him. He keeps his head clear and does not allow his circumstances to overcome or distort the truths that he knows regarding his king. It's easy to become overwhelmed when you're bombarded by evil or by evil circumstances, right? And when one... When one becomes overwhelmed, it is easy to start blaming God. Why are you doing this? David certainly, certainly could have done this based on his experiences. He certainly could accuse God of being the source of evil, but he didn't. Rather, he stood on the truth that God finds no pleasure in evil. This morning, it's my prayer that you too may cling to this truth as you face evil times and encounter evil people. The second principle builds upon the first. Because God is not the source of evil, because he finds no pleasure in it, cling to the truth that God is dealing with evil right now. He has dealt with it is dealing with it and will deal with it once and for all. It cannot escape him. And it certainly does not catch God off guard. Ha! Didn't see that coming, did you, God? Before time began, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit addressed evil. A plan was put in place to deal with it. 
And God is carrying out that plan. He has not fallen asleep on the job. Just because evil is still in our world does not mean God is not dealing with it. When I look at verses 4 through 6, I see this was David's perspective as well. He clung to the truth, clung to the truth, even though evil threatened his very life. I fully recognize the difficulty of evil and how it's present in our world. I also recognize how an emotional issue it can be when it surfaces and crushes our hearts. It's my prayer that you will cling to the truth that God is dealing with evil right now, even as you face evil times and encounter evil people. Finally, the last principle builds on the previous two. God will ultimately do away with all evil. He will do that when Jesus returns. He will purge all of creation of sin and evil. He will also give us new bodies at that time that will be totally free from the stain and curse of evil. Ones that will allow us to live with him for time without end. This is his promise to us who are in Christ Jesus. It is our glorification. It's my prayer that you will cling to the truth that God will one day ultimately do away with evil in all its forms. May you please keep these things in mind as you face evil times and evil people. And may you live in anticipation of Jesus' return. Let's reflect on these things during our time of prayer. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to write these principles on our hearts. Let us keep in mind our continuing prayers for healing, for Anna, for Caroline, for Nolan, for Mary. How's, how's your mom doing with her wrist? Doing better? Okay, let her know we're still praying for her. Let's pray as the Spirit leads.
So we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today as a reminder of God's plan to redeem a people for himself. As a reminder that if you're in Christ Jesus, it's because he chose you. While you were dead in your sin, God gives you new life, life from above. And he promises that he will hold that gift secure to that time when you will get to experience it in its fullness when Jesus returns. So I'm going to invite you to stand, slide out of your seat, come forward, take these elements, bring it back with you to your pew, and then we'll take those together in remembrance. Do we have responses? Okay. So, partaking of the Lord's Supper reminds me 
many of the things that we just looked about in Psalm 5. There was a time that I was an enemy of God. I was hated. But God's love still poured through. And no longer was I an enemy, but I'm a friend. I'm his child. He drew me. He gave me understanding. He allowed me to take of the gift that he freely offers to me. I know it could sound harsh how God hates the sinner and how he balances that with divine love and how I am to do the same thing. Hate sin, hate sinner, but still allow the love for an individual created in the image of God to break through. So I share Christ with them and I leave the results up to God because you never know. They too might receive that gift of salvation. That's what I remember when I get ready to partake of the bread. And I think that that was the point that Jesus made to his disciples that well. Join with me. And when he had taken some bread, he blessed it and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. When I drink of the cup that's symbolic of the shed blood of Jesus, I think sometimes my hatred could result in shed blood. Not mine, but the one I hate, which is not glorifying to God. If you want to shed someone's blood to an enemy, let it be Jesus's. Join me, and in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten and gave thanks. He said, this cup which is poured out for you, for many, for forgiveness of sin, is the new covenant in my blood. I'm thankful for what Jesus has done for me. How about you? Not just for me, but for you, right? He's done for you. Before we're dismissed, uh, let's stand and unite our voices together by singing Be Unto Your Name. There's a basket in the back if you'd like to uh, give something to our benevolent fund to help those in need or, again, to our mission in Honduras. Uh, I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to milk your wallet. You know, give as the Lord leads you. But let's Praise him one more time before we're dismissed.
Let your praises continue as you leave this place. May all that you do be for his honor and glory. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith.